What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lockdown Badgers. I'm your host, Ryan Herrings. Awesome guest today. He's been on the show a couple times. I'm excited to get him back on to talk about everything that's happened in football, plus get his take on the basketball side. We're going to talk about some of his bad takes, his good takes, and also get into the, the incredible changes at the quarterback room. All that and more in today's Lockdown Badgers. You're not going to want to miss it. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, everybody? Ryan Herring, host the Locked On Badgers. Thank you, as always, for making this one of this your first listens every single day, your team every day. Uh, we're going to bring Dylan Graff into the show. Been on the show twice now. Always exciting when I get to talk to you, Dylan, although we talk a lot on Twitter by itself. But thank you for joining the show, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, so much. The last time you talk, we were on the show together, it was before the basketball season. It was before all the craziness. We haven't talked on the show since Paul Christ left, since Jim Leonard left, since Luke Fickle came on, since Phil Longo came on. Um, I just did a show about some of my bad takes, some of my better takes from 2022. I wanted to ping you on this one. Where, where were you most off or most on for your Badger takes in 2022? Where I was most off by a mile was I did not think Paul Christ was on the hot seat whatsoever this season. Matter of fact, I told my best bud Coop, I think that he has this year and another year after this before he even has to worry about getting canned. And obviously I was dead ass wrong. Uh, after Jim Leonard became the interim, I would have bet the farm that Jim was going to be the head coach wrong again. Uh, if I had to pick somewhere, I was right in 2022, both of which came on the basketball end. I had written something about Johnny Davis having you know, a breakout season, which I don't think was all that bold. Everyone kind of expected him to be the guy, but I don't think anyone really expected him to be the Big Ten player of the year. That even exceeded my own expectations, but I did think that he would be you know, an all-Big Ten guy. And uh, Chucky Hepburn, I had him also slotting into the point guard role. Um you know, right out, right out the gate. And I think he impressed right away. So th those were two on the basketball side that I was right about. But as far as football, I, uh, I could not have been more incorrect on the coaching situations. Let me ask you this. Cause I, I had this conversation with, and it's blending in my head. I don't remember what show this was, but do you think Paul Chris came into the season on a quiet hot seat? Or do you think it was the first couple of games that really accelerated that? Honestly, if you're willing to make a move on a guy five games in, I think that he came in on a hot seat and none of us knew anything about it. McIntosh obviously had his short list. And I, I truthfully, I think that he probably wanted Jim Leonard to be the guy, but he needed to see it before he was willing to make a move because Paul Christ was a highly successful football coach for a long time. And five games in, yeah, it, it looked like we were taking, you know, steps backward. The offense looked prehistoric. It, we were heading the wrong direction under Paul. Unfortunately, you know, not to you know say anything negative about him. He was terrific at Wisconsin, but I think he did enter on a hot seat. And just given the way Wisconsin usually conducts their business, I don't think a lot of us gave that a lot of thought. No, it was stunning to me as well. That was also one of my my mistakes is I thought there was no chance that Chris McIntosh would come in and make that, that bold of a move. He's a Wisconsin guy. Um, but having done that, Taking a step back, because I do this kind of every day. I do a lot of day-to-day -day takes. Um, I haven't talked to you in a while. Having seen this unfold, is Wisconsin football in a better spot now? Infinitely. I not, Never in my wildest dreams could I have pictured, at least on paper, what is happening right now. Bringing in a guy like Luke Fickle, first of all. Like The guy, you know, we don't know what offers were or were not on the table, but he was at least being considered for USC and Notre Dame. Like this is a guy who almost any program in the country would have had interest in pursuing if they had a vacancy. And he chose to come to Wisconsin. You know, we backed up the money, we paid him. He came. Like we have a top 10, 15 head coach in college football right now. And his influence is significant. I mean, he was able to bring in Phil Longo. Like we just brought in Bobby Ingram this past year with no play calling experience. He was not an offensive coordinator. And we paid him top five money for an offensive coordinator. And we were, a lot of us viewed that as a win. Like we had an offensive coordinator. Luke Fickle shows up and he goes and pulls one of the top like offensive coordinators in the country. I don't think anyone saw that coming. I mean, and with the influence of both of them, look at what we've done as far as bringing in quarterbacks. Like the offense 
we have a lot, a lot to be excited about. A lot of pieces that are in place right now that are going to probably succeed under their tutelage. I mean, as far as recruiting, I, I'm not, I don't think that they're going to all of a sudden be pulling top 15 classes or anything. I'm not, you know, unrealistic, but I, I do believe that they will be able to get a slightly higher caliber recruit, at least a few more a class than we're, than we're accustomed to. I, I think the program is truly trending back to where we were back in like 2016, 17, 18, 19. I think we'll get back there pretty quickly. Talk to me about realistic expectations for next year. Like what? So here, cause our fan base very quickly goes from, and this is typical of a lot of fan bases. Like we're fanatics for a reason, right? But now we're seeing this, this team with, with fickle and these quarterbacks and Longo, are, are we going to win the conference next year? Are we going to win the division next year? Is that realistic? Because there's going to be a lot of turnover. The defense took some hits. What's realistic I, in your mind? I've been having this conversation a lot with myself the last few days. Uh, I do think that winning the West is got to be – it's kind of got to be the bar. I, I think coming in next season, you know, we return both of our top backs, our top three receivers, our entire starting offensive line – and then you add in, you know, a higher caliber quarterback in Tanner Mordecai. Like, I, I think offensively, no, they're not probably going to come out and become some offensive juggernaut, but they're going to be competent. I have the utmost confidence in that. The offensive line is going to be better, and that's where it starts. Once they improve, the offense as a whole will improve. Defensively, you know, obviously, no, you don't get better when you lose a Benton and a Herbig, but they do return starters at all three levels, and that's important. I think they'll find guys, a couple in the portal, fill in a few holes. I mean, we, you know, we had talked uh, just before the show, the Badgers actually finished 11th in total defense, even though it was, you know, by our standards, a down year. I don't think it would be unrealistic for the defense to be, you know, top 15, top 20 again. And we, we don't know what the defense exactly will look like, but there's enough returning talent that I think we can, we can feel pretty good about it. And overall, I think, that winning the West is a strong possibility. Let me ask you this, and I'm shotgunning you with this question, but I, I'm really curious to get your insight on it because you're you're definitely mm-hmm. someone whose opinion I really respect on this kind of stuff. What is Paul Christ's legacy? Like, let's say let's say Luke Fickle comes in and has a great first year. Does it reflect poorly on Paul Christ? What or or let's say Luke Fickle comes in and it, it goes poorly. Does Paul Chris looked at as the coach that let everything that Barry Alvarez built unravel? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think that I, I, at least personally, I view him as the man who saved the program mm. uh, post Gary Anderson. I, not that Anderson, we had success under him, but I think when he left that without someone that carried the kind of stability that Paul came in and gave Wisconsin, they could have gone they could have gone the direction that, that they were in this season a lot quicker. And he came in and he, he saved, he salvaged what was going on there. He got, he built them back up to, we were damn close to going to the college football playoff under Paul. That's true. I, I kind of, I kind of go the other way. Like I, I, I don't hold on to how it ended so much as how it began and kind of the, the meat of it all. I think he kind of saved it from what Anderson was kind of shifting to, and he was able to, to bring it back. No, that's a really good insight. And that, that is a good take on it because we're, we, you know, when Gary Anderson left, and I did a, a show on why Badger fans should thank Gary Anderson for coming here. And it was largely revolved around bringing Dave Aranda, the 3 4 defense. Yeah, um, absolutely. That was huge. It was incredible, right? And that set the bedrock for what Wisconsin would become for the next decade. But like if Gary Anderson had stayed much longer, that recruiting was starting to crumble, the in state connections were crumbling. So, I mean, Paul Chris really did come in, keep that defense, but stabilized everything else. Um, that's a really good point. And a guy who won 70% of his games at Wisconsin. Yeah, it's hard, it's, hard, it's hard to look at a guy who had that kind of success and have any kind of ill will towards him. And definitely a good dude. But if you had to boil it down, like what was his biggest downfall, in your opinion? Again, some of this is rehashing for people, but it's because I haven't talked to Dylan about this in a long time, and I want his take on it. I, I think it it comes down to his inability to adapt towards the end, and I think that is on a few levels. Uh, recruiting, I mean, obviously you left a, the recruiting department vacant. Like we can talk to or blue in the face about that, but that inexcusable. Yeah, I, I don't think he cared to, you know, put as much time into that as as was necessary. 
and uh, really on offense didn't evolve at all. He he knew how to win a certain way, and he was damn good at it. But at a certain point, teams knew how to combat that, and he didn't really have a counterpunch for it. And eventually, the wheels kind of fell off as a result. I, I don't think he was willing to step out on a limb and try something a little different. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty fair. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about quarterbacks. I want to get Dylan's opinion on which one he is potentially most excited about of this slew that is either committed or coming to Madison. We're going to talk about that incredible new quarterback room coming up next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at LinkedIn. Um, As a small business owner, and we've talked about this before, LinkedIn is just your number one source, your leadoff hitter for all of your success in 2023 for hiring new people. I know Luke Fickle is on LinkedIn looking for a new running backs coach, defensive line coach. It's a resource we all utilize when making small hires because you, you can't mess up on hires these days. It's hard to find the right people. And quite frankly, if you hire the wrong one, it's kind of hard to get rid of them. LinkedIn Jobs helps you attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools going beyond resume data um, to search through their 875 million member profiles to find the right people for you Um, and the right people um, on the other side as well. So there's it's win-win nobody's wasting their time and you're not wasting your time. It's something I've used personally to expand my professional network. It's something my company uses to screen out people that have no business um, coming into your job interviews. Again, saving time is saving money and it's saving, it's saving resources and it's saving energy. And it's why small businesses continue to rate, LinkedIn Jobs, number one in developing, are delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Uh, when you're done here, go check out Lockdown Sports today. All the biggest news uh, stories and sports and scores of the day in one spot, like only the Lockdown Network can provide. And again, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who has tuned into the show, who made last year great, who's going to make the next year great. Uh, Really do appreciate y'all as we continue to build up this Badger community. All right, let's get Dylan Graff back on. And Dylan, speaking of building up the Badger community, one of the reasons I love having you on is I think in a lot of ways you and I share a common goal, right, to to build up the Badger community, to provide um, an outlet for people to come on and share their voices Definitely want to give you an opportunity uh, with Badger Notes. Where are you at? Um, how can people find your work? And how can people kind of join in to what you're doing? So uh, I co-own uh, BadgerNotes.com with Anthony Wright. And uh, right now, we the website, we are anyone who wants to write about the Badgers, has opinions they want to share, anything. If you're listening to this, reach out to me. I will bring you on. I'll help you. I'll edit your work. Whatever you need from me, I will provide you the tools. We will promote your work. We will get you out there. Uh, Badger Notes is it, it's for the people. Everyone who wants to be a part of it is welcome to be a part of it. Uh, th- that's that's really our mission here, um, and, and that that's that's where I'm writing right now. I'm I'm all in on Badger Notes. Uh, that's where you can find my work at this point. And anyone else who is listening, reach out. I'd love to have you. That's awesome, man. And uh, Rajiv, our, our our guy Rajiv, who's been on the show, has also been involved in Badger Notes. And again, that's. Not to diverge too much from what we're talking about, but that's really where Dylan and I are both, and I think I can speak for you in this, really trying to just give people a platform. Um, and Dylan is somebody, I, I subscribe to his work. I think he does incredible um, incredible work, unique work. And it's, it's a place I go to get different insight that I don't get anywhere else. But I also, even if I didn't do that, I love what he's trying to do and just building up different voices in the Badger community. So definitely go check him out. We'll link his show in the notes as well. Um, and hopefully keep getting him on this show as well. So it's going to be Appreciate great it. right there. Um, let's talk quarterbacks. So in the span of, I, I put this out, I think on Twitter at some point in the span of roughly four months, <clears> right? You went from a quarterback room of Graham Mertz, Chase Wolf, Deacon Hill, Miles Burkett, Marshall Howe to a quarterback room of, um, Tanner Mordecai, Nick Evers, Cole LaCrue, Miles Burkett, Marshall Howe. And then in 2024, um, the four-star quarterback out of Texas, Marbury Medauer. Which quarterback, I want to start here for you, which quarterback was the most surprising to you to jump on board? Honestly, for me, it was Mordecai. Um, you know, I he, he, he was going to dip his toes in the NFL water, sound like he was going pro, and then all of a sudden in the 11th hour, he enters the portal and is at Wisconsin, like pretty much the second he drops his name in the portal. So that one absolutely blew me away. Uh, Evers was also a tremendous surprise. You know, if Mordecai wasn't here, I would say that hands down. Um, you know, but then even for all the same reasons, Medauer is kind of in the same boat. But I, I do have to say Mordecai, 
Um, I, I just didn't see it. I, I knew they were going to need a veteran option. You can't have that many freshmen, redshirt freshmen, all competing for the spot. But, uh, wow, R- Luke Fickle really outdid himself. In, that's that's the start of next year. I mean, but, like it, the competition still has to happen. Spring ball still has to happen. But barring some surprise, I mean, they're bringing Mordecai in to start. He's coming here to start. 100%. I want to talk about what comes next. And this is where I've seen Badger fans. It's weird. It's a weird spot for Badger fans to be in because we're not used to having a lot of young quarterbacks we're excited about simultaneously. Right. And Badger fans have already kind of said, well, is Burkett going to get a chance? What about LaCruz? Is he worried about competition? I, I just kind of want to say, I want to kick it to you, but I also kind of want to say, like, that's the reality of stacking a position in 2023. And it kind of stinks in a way. You you always have to keep recruiting a position. You got to create death. It doesn't matter if it's a strength. You need to keep it a strength. And that's, you know, what they're doing here. I mean, they didn't stop right when they got Evers and got a commitment from Met Hour. Like they, they went and found Mordecai. Like they're stacking it up. Uh, Long term, you know, I, I'm probably honestly the highest on Met Hour. Uh, you know, uh, Lauren Stoppelganger. I, the, the kid is tremendously talented. He's got just a, a powerful arm and a big body. The guy is, a, you know, he's not a burner, but he can run and he'll truck you. Like long term, I think he's who I am most excited about. But there are a lot of talented arms, and that's a beautiful thing. Like just because I like one guy or another guy likes someone else, that doesn't mean we're writing off the next guy. We like all of the arms that we have in the room, and the cream is going to rise to the top. That's how this works, and it's it's really cool that we are in this position right now. Because, as you mentioned, you know, the past couple of years, it was just Graham Mertz's job, period, and there was no competition. Yeah, it's been wild how little competition there really has been. Because, like, Chase Wolf didn't look terrible in the guaranteed no. rate price bowl, or guaranteed rate game bowl, sorry. Like, he didn't look terrible. Um, but he never got clo- – it never felt like he was close to even challenging Graham Mertz. And that's it, just wild to me with how inconsistent Graham Mertz was. Right, yeah, it – you can't you can't have that. You, you you always need to have someone looking over your their shoulder. That's iron sharpens iron. And you know, Graham Graham got considerably better. He had a really nice season for us. Uh the back half was rough, but yeah, he, he never had to be concerned about losing the job. They discussed at one point, I believe the Nebraska game about benching him at halftime, but even that didn't happen. We just didn't have the options behind him. Yeah, and you're going from that to what we have now. Like I talked to uh Cole LaCrue on the show and I asked him about competition. This was um, right after Evers committed. And he said, you know, only one guy can see the field. Um, it's it's just going to be really interesting, but Patrick fans are going to have to be uh, prepared for the fact that a couple of these guys will probably transfer. And it doesn't mean they're, they're bad dudes. It doesn't mean they're untalented, but there can only be one guy in the field and people already have their favorites. People really like Burkett, right? The in-state kid, yeah. obviously. There's a um, lot to like about him. Lots to like about lots to like about Cole LaCrue, right? There's a lot to like about Nick Evers. It's going yeah. to be a dogfight. Yeah, there there's some toolsy quarterbacks, and it's really exciting. What about this one? So I kind of wanted to go here. Have you wrapped your mind around the fact that not only is Luke Fickle here, but next year we will be running some variation of an air raid system with a quarterback that threw 72 touchdowns the last two seasons? <laughs> a little bit. It, it's 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 really hard when that I've only watched one style of football my entire life. I've known what to expect. I mean, you could go on to YouTube and Paul Christ had his zone or his own running scheme on there. You could watch, you could learn some of the plays. Like you knew what you were watching and uh, yeah, we can throw all that out the window. We are doing something entirely different now. And I feel like it's not going to feel real to me until I'm actually watching it. Yeah. It's, it's going to, Hopefully there's a spring game next year, right? To at least like let That's us right. a little a little preface into what's going to happen. Um, I want to finish up here with kind of the offense, the quarterback room, everything, all the changes we've seen. I was talking that we had a, we had a live show. We were talking about Phil Longo and some of the impacts. And one of the the people came on the show and asked, well, "What about the running game? Like Braylon Allen is used to being a bell cow, and you know how is he going to look without um, kind of that 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 emphasis in the running game?" And I said, "Listen, Phil Longo is still going to run the ball." And quite frankly, Braylon Allen might look a lot better with less people in the box. I think so 100%. I mean, you can look at multiple of his offenses at North Carolina. He is not afraid to feature his best players. I mean, he had Michael Carter and Javante Williams each run for over 1,000 yards. You aren't going to just throw the football when you have Braylon Allen and Chesma Lucy in your backfield. Like, 
they're not going to see eight man boxes all the time. When you have three wideouts on the field, you're going to spread it out. They're probably going to be more efficient next year. Like Braylon Allen, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying he'll probably have more rushing yards next season than he did this year. He, he'll be able to, you know, more likely stay healthier and he's going to have better running lanes. And realistically, the offensive line is going to be a year older. They're probably going to be better as well. I think a lot of the offensive linemen that we have are actually better suited to play in space than in a phone booth. So I kind of think that Phil Longo's offense will accentuate the strengths of a few of them. I We're going to run the football plenty. I, I'm not concerned about that. It's just going to look different. It's going to be a power run, like spread offense. I We're not throwing the ball 50 times. I really don't believe that. No, I agree with you. And I, I think it's going to be pretty balanced. And Braylon Allen is going to have a lot of room to roam. All right, coming up, we're, we're going to talk some basketball, something that Dylan and I love to chop up. We talk about, does he feel better about the team right now than what he did when he started the season? We're going to talk about the next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. All right, bring Dylan back in. Um, again, appreciate everybody tuning in to the show. Really, really do appreciate the support. Appreciate Dylan coming on, as always. We don't get him on here near as much as I would like to. Um, Dylan, we talked before the season. You were we, we were both higher on this team than the ridiculous, this team's going to finish 8th, ninth, 10th in the Big Ten. But do you feel better right now about this team than you did when you started the season? I really do. Uh, you know, in the preseason, I – you know, predicted that they would finish somewhere between four and six. And I understand that's not, you know, going out a limb and picking a number. I kind of figured they'd be in that range fighting for that double buy, which is where I still feel like they're going to be. But after seeing it, I do feel better. I, I think the pieces just fit together very well. You know, Chucky has taken a step forward. Like he's become a plus shooter. I am enamored with Max Klesmet. I think that he is one of the most important players on the team. And he is doing so many things that are helping this team win games that people don't realize for someone who scores six points a game. You know, Tyler Wall has elevated his game. Steven Kral is somebody who I've been very impressed with. Jordan Davis has been rock solid. Sejan has been a rock star. And for all the heat that he takes, you know, I got a soft spot for Carter Gilmore. The guy is doing the damn thing. He's working his ass off. He's given solid minutes. We've got roughly a seven-man rotation. I feel really good about it. I really do. I, I feel like this team, I, I feel like they are going to get a double bye. I think they're going to finish in the top four. I do feel uh, more confident. Can I tell you, so the Gilmore thing is interesting to me. Um, I think I think if he was the like the eighth guy in a rotation, like the, the problem is he's, other than Connor, nobody can come off the bench and score. Right. Right. And that's not Carter's fault, by the way. Like Carter no. – is I think the last time I looked leading the team in offensive rebound percentage, he's one of the best players in steal percentage. Uh, he, he rotates really well. He's much better physically than he was last year. You can tell he's stronger yeah, and leaner. hundred percent. He so really committed he, to getting better physically. And you can see it. Like he does yeah. a lot of, but he's just, he like for whatever reason, he has been atrocious offensively. He's shooting 30% from the line, like 20. I mean, it's, 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 and that's the problem. Like, if he could be a little better offensively, I think people would wouldn't be so critical because a lot of his misses they look bad, right? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. But but he does so many little things. Like, there's there's no secret why guard puts him out there. Um, let me let me ask you this. One of my takes. Do you tell me if you agree or disagree? Because I really want your your take on this. One of my takes be, at the beginning of the year was that Chucky Hepburn would struggle more this year because defenses would be more geared to stop him. Right, especially there'd be longer, more athletic defenders on him. He would struggle at the rim more. Um, do you agree with that take, or am I off base there? No, I would say that I agree with it. I mean, I think that uh, you know it's it's pretty clear that even he or Greg feel the same way because he's really committed to being a jump shooter. I and that last year he obviously took quite a few as well. That wasn't wasn't his role to be you know get into the bucket all the time. That was Johnny's, but. Uh, this year, he's he's seeing the other team's best wing defenders because, you know, as you and I had kind of mentioned before, that Klesman's not real big, and so it kind of gives defenses the flexibility to put who they want on Chucky. But I think that he's been able to mitigate that a little bit by, you know, improving so much beyond the arc. He He's taking so many of his shots from three, and he's connecting at 49% right now. That's crazy. It, so while, yes, he, he has – struggled in those ways i think that he's found a way to counteract it right now 
Yeah, that's a it's a great point. The shooting, and especially lately, like his shooting has been just awesome, awesome. Yeah, awesome. just dynamite. He's just he's a microwave when he makes sees one or two go through. How how surprising is it for you to see Stephen Crowell lead the team in assists? It isn't. I coming out of high school, that was I, in my recruiting profile that I had done on him. That was the thing that I was most enamored with in his game was his passing ability out of the low post. I, I given the way the Badgers offense operates, not at all. Let me ask you this really quick. What is one thing that you would like to see the Badgers do? Maybe, maybe change, whether it's a rotation, um, player minutes, an emphasis somewhere the rest of the year to you think would help them hit their ceiling. Really just continue to generate post touches. I, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to back their man down and take a shot at the cylinder but just not – there are times that are within the flow of the game when the game's pace picks up a little bit where they get away from touching the post, and that's when you see Tyler kind of, you know, start to play make a little bit from, from the wing and take the ball into his own hands a little bit. And I don't love – I'm not saying he's out of control, but there are times where I think it's a little bit unnecessary where when we slow it down and are able to generate more natural touches – that's when guys like Asijin and Jordan Davis are able to, you know, get easy buckets on cuts through the lane. I think the offense opens up quite a bit when they're able to touch the low post. And that's why we're seeing Crowell, you know, succeed the way that he is. But I would say just to slow it down, sometimes they let the pace. I mean, we don't need to get up and run. That isn't who we are. Just slow it down, touch the post. And then that's our three point shooting is the greatest beneficiary of that. Mm hmm which has been, we talked about the before of the year, that was part of the team that would have to improve from, not just from last year, which was quite frankly pretty terrible, but just yeah. to just to get away from, like they didn't have a Johnny Davis to get to the bucket to get those free throws. They had to shoot better this year. And for the most part, they have. Klesman shot well. Uh, Tyler Walls actually hit a couple. Jordan Davis has hit some. You said Hepburn, Connor, Siege, and obviously. Got three guys over 40%. Yeah, it's definitely worked. I, I would like Klesman to take more shots. I feel Same. like he's a little hesitant at times. Yeah. Like, even on open looks, he's a little hesitant at times. He has the second lowest usage rating on the team, and that includes everybody. Yeah. I, I, I'm I, 100% confident that he can score more. He could score double digits tonight if he wanted to. That's just not the role that he has taken on. I would like to see him shoot more because he's he really is a knockdown shooter. Let me ask you a couple rapid-fire questions to wrap up here. First one is, most important guy off the bench not named Connor. It's got to be Carter Gilmore. There is nobody else behind that can log minutes down low. I mean, Marcus Ilver would be the next man in. And right now, the game is moving too fast for him on defense and offensively. I wrote about this this morning. Nobody loves to see themselves shoot more than Marcus Ilver. He has far too high of a usage rating for a guy who plays five minutes a game. He's just not ready yet. Physically, he's he's there, but defensively, he he can't. He can't make up for the things that Gilmore is doing well because we don't have anyone else. And Chris Hodges just is not able to log minutes right now. That's not a knock on him. Someday he might be able to, but right now he can't. And while I, I would, I, you could make an argument for Kamari McGee, but I, I have to go with Gilmore right now just due to lack of options behind him. Big shot <clears> in the game. Who do you want taking it? Three seconds left down two. Down two. Uh, so a lot of people have been talking about this and they want it to be Chucky. I actually feel differently. Um, if it was a three point game, I would say Chucky, but I, if there's enough time on the clock, I'm getting the ball down to Tyler wall on the low block and I'm letting him go to work. He is so efficient down there. And truthfully, if he gets followed, he's improved as a free throw shooter so much more that I'm not as concerned that is what I would, that's what I wanted to happen at the end of a few late game scenarios this year. And it didn't happen. Uh, it's not a knock on Chucky. I, I feel just fine with him taking, you know, the last shot. He's made several big ones, but uh, I, I would get the ball down to Tyler wall. Yeah. I, I actually really quick say, I agree with that a hundred percent. And again, it's not a knock on Chucky. I just think Tyler wall can generate a higher percentage shot in the post or He's a pretty good passer. Like if they yep. collapse on him, he's going to find a pretty open look. So he and Stephen Crowell's two man game is really coming along nicely. They play well off each other down there. I agree. All right, a young player that you think in two years is going to be really, really good on this team, better than you thought. That is currently on this team. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
I'm I'm still going to say that I think Marcus Ilver has a chance to be a, a really solid player. I don't think there are a lot of high up, high upside options currently on the team. I mean, of the people that are currently in the rotation or haven't broken through, I don't love a lot of the options. I don't think we have all that great of depth. I do think the 2023 class offers better answers than that because I think there are two guys in that class that could potentially jump Marcus Ilver pretty quickly. Um, I'm not real in love with the options for the future, truthfully. I, I think that we have not seen the best of Kamari McGee yet. I think that he'll be a really solid bench point guard. Well, let's jump to that 23 class then. And the two guys you're referencing, obviously, Gus Yald and Nolan Winter, uh, both players who I think are are tremendous gets for Greg Gard. And John Blackwell is a pretty good get as well. Yeah. Who Out of those two, though, let's talk Gus and Nolan. We'll wrap up here. Which player has the better the better Badgers career? I think I could we I think we would probably agree Nolan Winter might have the higher upside as, as yeah, a pro player. That, a pro definitely. But which player I, has a better Badger career? I'm gonna take Yeldon. Uh the guy is just incredibly fundamental. He's very skilled. There's nothing gonna be all that flashy about his game. He's not a high flying athlete or anything, but I he is somebody who I think in two, three years is going to be making a tremendous impact and somebody who is going to be just a, a uniquely dominant player. He, it's going to look a lot different than a lot of other teams, but he's someone that he, he would be my pick to probably have the better Badger career. And I, and I really like Nolan Winter. Yeah, I love it. I, I love both those prospects coming in. Same. Um, all right, he is Dylan Graff. As always, we are smarter because you joined the show. Go check out his work over at Badger Notes. We'll link that in the show description as well. Uh, definitely a friend of the show and, and someone whose opinion I respect a lot. So thank you, Dylan, for jumping on the show as always, my friend. Thanks for having me. Have a good yeah, one. For sure. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, as always, thank you for jumping on the show. Really do appreciate it. Continue tuning in and watching when you get a second on Wisconsin, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.